We are going to take a week out of our study of 2 Timothy. As Matthew said, this is Reformation weekend. This is the celebration of God raising up some people to bring his word back to the forefront. When we talk about being uh, reformed in doctrine, what we're reformed to is, is back to the truths that we received from Jesus Christ, from the disciples, from the apostles, through the, the canon. So those are the things that we are going to look at. I'm going to cover a lot of ground. I usually do this in five messages. I'm going to do it in one this year. And so we'll we're going to cover a lot of ground to, to look at the Reformation very quickly. But if you want to find Colossians chapter 2, and then find that eighth verse, once you've done that, if you please stand with me as we honor God with the reading of his word. Colossians 2, beginning in verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human traditions, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Father, as we, as we study in your word today and as we look at these doctrines that, that you have given us, May we honor and glorify you, Lord. I ask, Father, that you would speak through me. Lord, I know that I am a sinner. But I know also that I am a sinner that has been saved by grace. And I am covered in the righteousness of Christ. So I ask you to use me this day to speak to these that you have gathered here in your house. That you be honored, not only in the words that are spoken, but in the hearts of each person who hears this message, Father. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we try to look at this every year, there, there's, there's five, what do you call them? Oh, but you called something else before that. Principles. principles. Five principles that we call the soles that came out of the Reformation. And, and these, these five principles, we really can call them pillars of our doctrine. Now, this is not a test, but... What are those? First one would be sole what? Scriptura, I heard someone over here saying. What's the next one? Solos Christos. First one, solo scriptura, scripture alone. Second one, solo, solos Christus, is Christ alone. Third one, sole, gratia, yeah. And, and that means grace alone. And now we have... Fourth is sola fide, which is faith alone. That's right. And the last one, which I think is as important as any of them, I hate to say any of them is more important than another, but this is the reason for all of them, is soli deo gloria. To God be the glory alone. So those are the, the five pillars that came out of the Reformation. And, and what this is, is, is getting the church back to what was being taught originally by Christ and by the apostles. We, we see it over and over in history. You know, it, it's really easy for, for a Baptist to, to blame the Catholic Church for going astray. But I, I'll tell you right now, if you want to go out and blame somebody, go look in the Baptist churches across this country. We've gone astray as Baptists. Go look in the Methodist churches across this country. We've gone astray as Methodists. Look in the Lutheran churches. Look in whatever denomination you want to. You'll find ones who have clung to God's word, and you'll find those who have gone astray. So we don't want to just simply blame the Catholic, the Roman Catholic. But that's who the church was at that time. So as we go through this today, there'll be a, a number of statements about what the Catholic Church was then, and, and maybe a few about today. Now, 
Matthew also mentioned Martin Luther, that the 31st is, is the 100 or 501st anniversary of Martin Luther nailing his 95 thesis to the door at Wittenberg, at the Wittenberg Church. And what, what this was, was this was a place where, where people often hung items for discussion. Martin Luther was, was of course, a German monk. He, he wasn't trying to start the Protestant, and by the way, look at how it's spelled, it's Protestant. He was not trying to start the Protestant faith. What he wanted to do was to reform the church. As he knew it, the church was the Catholic church. And so he wanted to, to see some reform because as he got to studying in the word, he got to seeing where there were things being done that didn't match God's word. And, and he was starting to have some trouble with this. and was, was having conversations about it. And then Tetzel was, was made the, the uh, commissioner of indulgences. Now, an indulgence is something that the Catholic Church did then, regularly, still occasionally. But it, it, was, it was the offering of forgiveness for money. You could have somebody who was in purgatory, brought out of purgatory for the right amount of money. Plus, not only did you get them out of purgatory, but you saved yourself time from purgatory as well. So you can go ahead and do a little more sinning if you want. He had a problem with this. And so he began to speak against it. His 95 thesis was 95 statements of question of doctrine within the church. And he wanted a discussion to go with this. He wanted to get people discussing it. He wanted to get the church discussing it so that they could come to that place where where the church was going back to Christ. Of course, that is not what happened. Tetzel's uh, marketing was strong. Some of his, his slogans, he would tell people, listen to the voice of your dear dead relatives. Friends, they're beseeching you, saying, pity us, pity us. We are in dire torment from which you can redeem us for repentance. Do you not wish to do this? That's what you would tell the people that their lost loved ones are saying from purgatory. Or if somebody would buy an indulgence and the coin would hit the coffer, he, he would say that, that uh, every time, I mean, read this, as soon as a coin hits the coffer, and the coffer rings, another soul from purgatory springs. So he was strongly selling the German people, mostly at this point, these indulgences. And, and let's face it, if we really believe that we can get somebody that we love out of purgatory or hell, with a few dollars, wouldn't most of us do that? Especially if we really believed that, that they were calling to us to do that because they were in torment. One of the reasons that this could take place is by this time the Catholic Church had gotten to a place where they wanted only the priest to have scripture. That's not to say there weren't others who had scripture. But they wanted only the priest. And, and the, the rule of the Catholic Church was, was simply this. That only the clergy, only the church could give a true interpretation of scripture. And in fact, in their, in their councils, they said that anyone who interpreted the scripture differently than the Catholic Church should be anathema, should be cursed to hell. They were raising money to build St. Peter's. And I tell you, they were raising lots of money. It, it was coming in. Martin Luther could take it no more. 
he could take it no more because he had he had been studying the word and he knew not only the indulgences but but so many things that that they were saying and teaching and doing were wrong so we wanted to get this discussion going and he he nails this 90th he says that was october 31st of 1517 that that he did that now make no mistake we we use that date as the sounding board of, of Reformation. But he was not the only one, and he was not the first. There were, there were men who came before him, such as John Wycliffe. He was sounding the, the gong of, of change. But there were others, too. There was, in Switzerland, John Calvin, and o or, sometimes I, my tongue is tied, Ulrich Zingli. In France, there were the, the Huguenots. And there was, in Scotland, John Knox. There were the Anabaptists. There were many who were, who were calling for this kind of change. Now, quite frankly, they didn't all agree on what that change was. But they were calling for, for change because they could see that the church had gone away from the scriptures. And the Roman Catholic Church bowed up against this, and, and most directly against Martin Luther. He, he, was, he was brought into a court of such, and was demanded that he recant those things that he had said. He asked for a little time to, to pray over this. And when he came back, he, and I'm paraphrasing, it's in there somewhere, he, he said, that unless my conscience by the word of God is guided, I cannot recant. In other words, he was saying, what I have seen and feel led of Scripture is only Scripture who would change my mind. Now, isn't that how we should all be? Matthew, feeling a little reformish last night, told me that he's, he's reformed, but if he ever found any reason not to be in the Scriptures, he would change. Okay, I agree with that. We, we should all, we should all be always looking to the Scripture for growth and understanding in in our walk with God. A couple of, of things, and th this is in 1962 to 1965, the Second Vatican Council, and here's here's a statement that came out of that. You know, it, it's easy to think of. 1517 is so far back. But most of us in this room, 1962 to 1965 isn't so far back to think about, right? This is a statement that came out of that, that council. It is not from sacred scripture alone that the Catholic Church draws her certainty about everything which has been revealed. But sacred tradition in its full purity, God's word, which was entrusted to the prophets. Therefore, both sacred tradition and sacred scripture are to be accepted and venerable with the same sense of devotion and reverence. So that tradition would, would have the same weight and meaning as scripture. Now, folks, Correct me if I'm wrong, but when I study the, the scriptures, one of the things that, that they bucked against Jesus the most was their tradition, wasn't it? Constantly they, they were bucking Jesus because of, of their tradition that he was challenging. It is scripture that, that we must turn to. Now, another thing that the Catholics believed and that the reformers knew not to be true was, was the fact that, and any, this is the way to even today, that whatever the, the Pope spoke had the same authority as Scripture. So if the Pope didn't like something, he could change it because he had the same authority as Scripture. Now as as Protestants, as 
pretty easy for us to see the error in that, isn't it? We we can we can uh, hear that and we, we know the difference. I was I was raised in the, the Catholic Church, and, and I had Thursday night CCD classes at right, right here in in Manhattan at seven dollars. I had I, I my sophomore year of high school I went to the, the Catholic school for a year. I had a Catholic priest that. <laughs> that I grew up under that I absolutely loved. He was, he was a wonderful person to me. There came a time when I had to hear from the scripture. It doesn't matter who our pastor is. It doesn't matter who our family is. It doesn't matter what our background is. There comes a time when we need to go to the scripture and by the Holy Spirit have ears to hear and eyes to see what it says. Another statement that they made, I wanted to, to read. I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's quite long, but it says, No one relying on his own judgment shall in matters of faith and morals pertaining to the edification of Christian doctrine, distorting the Holy Scriptures in accordance with their own conception, presume to judge or excuse me, presume to interpret them contrary to that sense which the Holy Mother Church has interpreted them. That only the church. This, this was something that in 62 they affirmed, but it was something they were already absolutely standing on in 1545. They, they have scripture that they use to justify that. But what we see today so often, and not, again, not just the Catholic Church, so many times people take scripture and they mold it and they make it to fit what they want it to say. And when we do that, when we've made scripture to fit what we want it to say, it is no longer God's word, but it is our imagination. And it no longer has any, any power. So what we have to do is, it's kind of like what we do on, on Sunday nights in our, our Bible study as we're going through Malachi. We're, we're, we're looking to see what is it God is saying as we break down each verse so that we have a full understanding of what it is that God is speaking to us through his word. Now, of course, the reformers, and Martin Luther in particular, had a great deal of difference with the Catholic Church. And they wanted to see change. Change. Not something new, because the fact is, is there is only one faith, right? There is only one God. And we might call ourselves by all these different denominational names, that there is only one true God, and there is only one true Jesus Christ. And that's it. Now there were some of those reformers who did want something different. But that was not Luther's intention. As, as time goes, goes on and, and the Reformers begin to hammer out what it is that, that Scripture says. They, they begin to put together these solas. And again, it wasn't their intention to make a, a five-point sermon. That wasn't their intention. But, but these were, were the pillars that they saw that hold Scripture up. And, and they felt that apart from these... Apart from these, we, we could do nothing and know nothing about Scripture. I mean, so much of what is, is just common to us as, as Baptists wasn't so common. And, and still today, there's many who, who would see it differently. At the conference this weekend, there was, there was a preacher from Junction City who who was there, and he was speaking, and, and he said that, that there was a church in Junction City, and I, when he said that, I, he didn't have to go any further. Whenever someone says there's a church in Junction City, I know which one they're talking about. 
But this church sends people to the baptisms of other churches. And as soon as somebody comes up out of the baptismal waters, they try to corral them and tell them that they have not completed what they need to for salvation. And that they have to come to their church so that they can speak in tongues and all these other things that come along with it. It's a lot of distortion of God's word. The Catholic Church believed that that righteousness and salvation, excuse me, righteousness and and um, sometimes my mind just goes blank. I have to go back and I have to, to look at you. Sanctification, that's the word I was looking for. Righteousness and sanctification are both a process that you do all of your life. Now, we know as we look at Scripture, what made us righteous? What did we do to make ourselves righteous? In fact, the truth of the matter is, is all of us are unrighteous, right? Every single one of us. But God because of the blood and the work of the cross that Jesus Christ did, because of this, he calls us righteous. Those who belong to him, we can say those who are the elect, those who are born again, those who are saved. I mean, there's a long list of ways we can say it. But those who are his, he has taken the righteousness of Christ and put that righteousness upon that sinner. They're still sinners. And now they're covered in the righteousness of Christ. So they have received or the word we use, the theological word we use, is they have, they have been Im imputed with righteousness. But then they, he takes the sin past, present, and future of those who belong to him, and he moves it over to Christ, and when Christ paid the debt on the cross, he paid the debt for all of them. One of the things that reformers say is that Christ's blood, his atoning blood, is sufficient for every man, woman, child who ever did and ever will live and every sin that they have ever, ever could commit. However, it is not effective for all, which should be a very simple thing for us to understand because if someone is not saved, the blood of Christ has no effect in, in bringing them out of hell, does it? So it's not effectual for everyone. Only those who belong to Christ, only those who believe, only those who are born again, by the way, I heard a wonderful sermon this weekend on being born again. Wonderful sermon. So, righteousness is something we receive when we are saved. When, when, when God gives us the new birth by Jesus Christ, he covers us with the righteousness of Christ. And we receive <coughs> that righteousness, and it stays with us. The sanctification... Now, this is a process, and we spend the rest of our lives growing in our knowledge and understanding of God. And the more we grow, the closer we get to Him. But one thing I have learned in, in my own sanctification is that the closer I get to Him, the further away I realize I really am. I'm thinking I'm pretty close until I start to grow, and I'm thinking, oh, I'm a little further. I'm closer than I was, but I'm a little further. And, and you just notice that as as you grow. So these, these soles that came from the Reformation. Sola Scriptura. The Reformers, the Scriptures say the Bible is the only authority for a believer. We say that the Bible is inerrant and infallible. It is perfectly right. 
is perfectly right. There are those who say, well, no, it's not perfectly right, including the Catholic Church. There are many Protestants who will say that as, as well. Or they'll, they'll say something to the effect that, well, that was meant figuratively, talking about Jesus' miracles and some of the things that he, he has done. They do not take the word for the word. But the Bible is the only authority, the final authority, for the believer. Now that's not to say that there isn't other truth besides the Bible. But any other truth that contradicts the Bible isn't truth. So if a truth is in agreement with the scripture, that is truth. But the only ultimate truth that is absolute is the Bible. That's what the scriptures teach us. The Roman Catholic Church concept is the Pope, tradition, and scripture are authorities for Christians. And we say the Pope, but really that, that begins to trickle down through the hierarchy of the Catholic Church. Next is the solo Christos. The Bible tells us that Christ's atonement is the only work that provides justification for man. That's what we were just talking about. Christ is the only way. There is no other way to the Father except through Jesus Christ. You ever hear someone say, well, we're all going to the same place. We're just taking different roads to get there? That's a lie. That's a lie. And that person who says that either wants you to go to hell or they're on the way and don't know it. Which is probably that's the one. So we need to be witnessing and sharing with that person the truth, don't we? It is Christ and Christ alone. Love the song. I, I was wanting to get with Matthew about a couple songs I wanted him to sing this morning, but I didn't do it, so I didn't say anything, but he, that was one of the ones I wanted him to sing. He, he did it without me asking I appreciate that. Now, our salvation is in Christ alone. But how does that happen? It happens by His grace alone, right? Isn't that what we, we learn in, in Ephesians? It is a free gift, lest anyone would boast. It is grace alone, sola gratia. See that in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It is by God's grace that he pours out on us, not because of anything we've done. Because that would add back in works like the Catholic Church and like so many Protestant churches today, including Southern Baptists. So many Southern Baptist churches think that you've got to do something to be saved. All we do is receive it. Now once we are saved, now that's a whole other ballgame. Everything changes then. We don't do anything to receive it. The scriptures teach us very clearly it is a free gift of God. A free gift does not come because of something you did. And there is so day for day. According to the Catholic Church, it is faith and works. Faith and works equals salvation. But according to the scriptures, it is faith alone that comes by God's grace alone, <laughs> that is in Christ alone. That, that's where we get the faith. In fact, I will go as far, and I've said this many times, that until we receive that faith, we do not truly understand the scripture. We cannot, because it is the spirit that discerns it to us. Until we receive that faith from him, we didn't muster that faith up, he gives it to us. Until we receive that faith from him, we do not see ourselves in light of who he is. Or in other words, we do not see our sin. We may know that we're not what we should be, but we do not see our sin as something that God hates. So we can just kind of wink at it. Until he gives us that faith, we do not know that we need to repent. What does the scripture tell us? 
when, when John the Baptist was baptizing in the, in the wilderness, and when Jesus came on the scene, what was, what was it they were proclaiming? Repent! For the kingdom of God is at hand. We do not know how or what to repent of until he gives us faith. Once he gives us faith, our eyes, our eyes, our ears are open, and we realize our need for Christ. We realize it from that. We, we know that, that apart from him, we are lost. And, and so we begin to repent because now we have this faith, though we don't know where it came from or not even really aware that it's there yet, but it has caused us to need to repent. And once we repent, then we, we call out to him, God save us. Lord, come into my life. Lord, lead me. We do call out. When, when someone says that, that we do not ask God to come into our life, that is not true. <coughs> He's already there, and he has given us the reason to see why we need him. And yes, we call out to him. Scripture says, if anyone seeks me, who seeks him? According to According to Romans 3, nobody seeks him. But he says, if anyone seeks me, I will not turn him away. Well, the one who seeks him is the one who has received faith from him through the vehicle of grace by the blood of Christ. And how did they get it? By the hearing of his word. And then that faith in us, that faith in us propels us into sanctification. Because the moment, the moment he gave us that faith by grace, we were covered with his righteousness. As Christians, we cannot stand our own sin. A Christian who is okay in his sin, don't take me wrong, I'm not saying Christians don't sin. I'm saying a Christian who is okay in his sin is not a Christian. Because the Holy Spirit within us will constantly bombard us about our sin. That's why Jesus, when he was, was preaching the Sermon on the Mount, and, and he said, blessed are those who mourn. What is it they're supposed to mourn? It's their sin they should be mourning. We should be mourning our sin because our sin has separated us from God. And as believers, even though we are still forgiven when we sin, if we are an unforgiven or if we have not sought his forgiveness for our sins, we are separated from him in fellowship. Not relationship, but fellowship. We are separated from him in that fellowship. And that fellowship is sweet to a Christian. So a Christian can't stand to stay in sin. Christian may struggle with the same sin over and over and over. And that is not that is not your you're okay to, to live in that sin. But to overcome it. And then finally, the fifth pillar, the fifth sole or principle is sole de opor. the glory of God alone. When, when we ask the question from the catechism, from the Baptist catechism, but it's also in the Presbyterian catechism, when we ask the question from the catechism, what is the chief end of man? We all here know the answer. It's, it's to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Well, we glorify God in our salvation and in the salvation of others. If we want to glorify God, first off, we have to be saved. But then we take that grace that is poured into us and let God pour it through us into others around us. And as we are being poured out into others, that grace that he's given us, their eyes are open too because with that grace is planted faith. And when their eyes are open, they see the great glory of God. <coughs> 
God who already has all the glory. I know I say that all the time, but it's important. He has all the glory. And, and when that faith comes in, they see that glory. And they're drawn to him. And that's where glorifying him comes in. When more people <coughs> see more of his glory. So we want people to see his glory. And we want the ones who are seeing it to see more of it. So we stand in the, in the scriptures. And we seek out to, to make sure, to be certain, that he is known in all of our life. Now the Catholic Church was against all of these. And I, I don't have time today. I, I have a lot of it here I wanted to go through with you, but uh, there's a number of statements in a number of different councils where they, where they rebuke those five solas. In fact, the, the Catholic Church calls it their reformation. But their reformation was to go as far away from what the Protestant Reformation taught as they could. And don't get me wrong here. I have friends that I love that are Catholic. I have so much of my family is Catholic. For years, Cynthia and the kids and I, we took care of the Catholic cemetery between here and Manhattan. And somebody asked me one day, how is it that they let you, a non-Catholic, take care of the cemetery. I said, it's because they still think I'm Catholic. They still don't believe I have it. I've converted. I have lots of friends and family that are Catholic. Some of them, though I do not understand why they are still in the Catholic Church, I believe we're saved. Because I see fruit in their life. But if that fruit is of them, they're lost. They're lost if that fruit is theirs. But if it is the fruit of the Spirit pouring out through them, then they are saved. One of the sermons this weekend was, was calling on us to be brokenhearted over those who are lost. The, the man who gave that sermon, he, he said that his community, they did some figuring, it's out in clear out in the very corner, northwest corner of Kansas, they did some figuring in that one out of every five people in town was saved from, from the different things that had been done, different surveys. One out of five was saved. So he said, that means four out of every five people I talk to when I walk out my door in the morning is dying and going to hell. He said, shouldn't that bother me? should, shouldn't it? Shouldn't that bother us? You know, St. George, I, I, I've got such a, a heart to desire for St. George. And I know when I walk out the doors of this building and walk through this community, it's at least that number. It's important for us to understand these truths because the lie does not save anyone. Okay? When we understand the truth, then we can take the scripture to them in truth that they too can see that they would receive that faith by grace so that God be glorified so that God be seen in them. As Protestants we believe that God's grace has caused our works. That we do the works, the good deeds, because of what he has done in us. Not to receive them and not to keep them. Okay, there's a lot of misunderstanding there too. We are not doing good works and good deeds to keep the salvation, to keep him happy with us. In the Reformation, they were fighting against the Catholic belief that it is faith plus works that equals salvation. 
this is why they were okay to sell indulgences. This is why they were okay to do so many things that did not match true scripture. I do want to read one more, one more statement from the Council of Trent. This is from the sixth session of the Council of Trent, and this would be 1547 when they held that session. It says, if anyone says that by faith alone the, ungo the ungodly are justified in such a way as to mean that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to receive the grace of justification, and that if it is not necessary for man to be prepared and disposed by the movement of his own will, let him be anathema, let him be cursed. Or in other words, if you say that you don't have to do anything to be saved, be cursed to hell. You see, these, these statements, these statements are in direct contradiction of what came out of the, the Reformation. There are things that, that they were standing on. I came across a, a story that I think I'm going to close with. I'm jumping down through the several pages of this. And I'm going to have to, to read it because when I try to paraphrase it, I'll miss something important. It says, there, was, there once was a king who chose for himself a bride who was poor, deformed, and hearted. She had no loveliness of her own. And yet the king wanted her. As their wedding day arrived, the king gave to his bride a wedding ring of faith. In the very second he placed that ring on her finger, she became his queen. And they were forever united. They became one. And all that was his became hers. His love, his blessings, his possessions, even his kingdom now belonged to her. Her bridegroom provided her with all his good things. He washed her with water of his word, dressed her with eternal righteousness, and presented her, despite her character, as a glorious bride without spot or wrinkle. This also meant that all that was hers became his. In the intimacy of the union, the king took on himself all of his bride's transgressions and debts. He takes a share of sin and death and hell of his wife. Nay, makes them his own, in fact. And deals with them, and deals with them no otherwise than as if he were the one who committed them. And as if he himself had sinned. Now this fallen woman was queen, but she had lived all her life as a prostitute. And so she did not know how to act as a queen. Though she was freed from the condemnation and, the, and showered with all her husband's blessings, though she could be fearless of death and safe from hell, her character was still that of a harlot. But though her union with the king, through her union with the king, her character no longer defined her. Her status as queen defined her. And the longer she lived with the king, the more her character changed to match him. It is impossible now that her sins should destroy her. Since they have been laid upon Christ and swallowed up in him. And since she has in her husband, Christ, a righteousness, she may claim it as her own, which she can set up with confidence against all her sins, against death and hell, saying, If I have sinned, my Christ in whom I believe has not sinned. All mine is his, and all his is mine. As it is written, My beloved is mine, and I am his. There were many during... Martin Luther's time, this is something he wrote, that I thought that was a disgusting story. 
And if we look at it from a human point of view, maybe it is. But the fact is, as Martin Luther was describing us, we are the harvest. We are the one, as we see often in the Old Testament when he's talking to Israel, we are the one who, who was the harlot or the whore. And when he took us, it wasn't because we had cleaned up. I talked to people and I said, well, I'm going to start trying to do better so I can do it. No. He takes us right where we are. When he puts his faith in, by his grace upon us, he takes us and we become the bride. We, the church, are the bride. Still flawed in character, folks. Still flawed. We sin. I do not endorse it, but I do it. Paul said, I do those things I don't want to do, and I don't do the things I want to do. That's us. But, if we belong to Christ, if we are part of the bride, that is washed away. The punishment is washed away. The, the debt is washed away. And we are called righteous by God the Father because of the righteousness of God the Son. And we can't let anybody, anybody rob us of what is ours in Him. But man will do it. I've talked much about the, the Catholic Church. Let me tell you, this is we all know who Robert Schuller is, right? Here's, here's a statement that he made once. He said, the Reformation is aired because it was God-centered rather than man-centered. That was his exact words. It was aired because it was God-centered instead of man-centered. It's not just the Catholic Church. It's not just Robert Schuller. Folks, we find it in the best of churches. In the best of churches, in the body, there's always those who do not love God. We do not know Him. And we can stand here all day on this reason why they might be in church. But the fact is, if they are not God-centered, if our doctrine is not God-centered, if our lives are not God-centered, then we don't know Him. Is far from us. And we need to be we need to be praying for those around us who are in that condition and they're everywhere because they are on their way to hell. And that should truly sadden us. It should break our heart. The scriptures in the Old Testament, you know, today we talk about breaking our heart out of the New Testament, but in the scriptures, it talks about bursting our bowels because of it. It should be so deep inside of us, our, our desire for them to be saved. You say, well, as, as reformers, we believe that, that God's going to save who he's going to save. So we don't have to be. No, that's foolishness. We are commanded in the scripture to take the gospel to all the world. All the world. There's one last thing I like to read before we close. This is John MacArthur. It says, Justification is distinct from sanctification. Because in justification, God does not make the sinner righteous. Excuse me. He declares that person righteous. He doesn't make us righteous. We're still sinners. He declares us righteous. He calls us righteous. We see that in Romans 3.28 and Galatians 2.16. Notice how justification and sanctification are distinct from one another. Sanctification imparts righteousness to the sinner personally and practically. Justification takes place outside the sinner. God justifies us. We do not justify ourselves. Sanctification is what takes part inside of us, growing us closer and closer to Christ. Closer and closer. Brothers and sisters, there's lots of things that come from the Reformation. 
And I dare say that there's lots of, of men within the Reformation who did not agree on certain topics. But when it comes to the basics and most important thing of getting the, the people of God back to the Word of God, these five areas, they stand. They stand together. And we stand with them because it is the Word of God. And since we're doing all this standing, why don't you stand with me now? Father, as we as we close, let us understand our, our condition as the bride of the King, the, the harlot who was able to take on the righteousness of the King and all that was His. Father, we thank You for, for Your love to us. And we ask, Lord, that You would use us to speak to our neighbors in this little community, beyond this little community, Lord, throughout our state, our country, and around the world, that we would have an impact for your kingdom. Not that they would glorify us, but sola deo gloria, that you would be glorified alone in the salvation as men and women come to see and to know your glory and to grow in their knowledge of it. Use us, Father. Send us into your world that we would make much of you. In the name of Christ Jesus, I pray.